Hey everybody, welcome to another Chris Beat Cancer interview. Today I'm on a cruise ship with Dr. Neil Barnard. And uh, I never thought I'd be in, on a cruise ship with Dr. Barnard doing an interview on a couch in my stateroom. So here we are. <laughs> Great but, to be here. Yes, thanks for taking the time to do this. I know you got a busy schedule. You're speaking oh, four times on this cruise, right? It's a pleasure. Yeah. So um, I have been a, f a fan of Dr. Barnard for a long time. He's written, we think, 19 books, but I think you lost count, <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, on nutrition, plant-based nutrition, uh, diabetes, hormones, uh, weight loss. I mean, you've pretty much covered every topic you know that I can think of. Uh, and you run a medical center. Mm -hmm. You started the Physicians Com Committee for Responsible Medicine, mm -hmm. which is an advocacy, and um, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah an advocacy yeah. group for plant-based nutrition. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to talk. And I'd love yeah. for you... Th the first thing I always want to know when I talk to someone who's a medical doctor and plant-based is, how did that happen? Yeah, for me, it was a bit of a circuitous path. I, I grew up in North Dakota. And I didn't know a thing about healthy eating. In fact, my extended family was all in the cattle business. But the year before I went to medical school, I had a job at a hospital in Minneapolis. And I was the autopsy assistant. So when somebody would die in the hospital, we would examine the body to figure out the cause of death. And one day there was a man who died in the hospital of a massive heart attack, probably from eating hospital food, but that's another story. <laughs> and um, the pathologist knew that I was going to go to medical school the following year, so every autopsy was kind of a lecture. Mm -hmm. and, and so in this particular case, the, had, the, the guy had had a heart attack. So the pathologist removed a big ch chunk of ribs off the chest. He set the ribs on the table, and that exposed the heart, which was filled with atherosclerosis. And he said, you know, look at it, feel it. Okay, you know, you can put your gloves on, you feel this crunchy stuff in the arteries. It's frightening. Hmm. Um, and so he would... And how did it look? How does the heart look that's atherosclerotic? Um, well, you, what you do is you slice open one of the coronaries, which are arteries that are right on the surface of the heart. In fact, that's where the name comes from. They're, they crown the heart coronary. Mm -hmm. So you slice them open, and then inside um, you feel it, and it doesn't feel like a soft, flexible tube. It feels hard, like a pipe stem or something like that. Hmm. It's, and it's crunchy. Um, and so this person had th th these artery blockages in the heart. That's what killed him. He had them in the arteries to his brain, meaning he was headed for a stroke um, if the heart attack hadn't killed him first. End of the exam, the pathologist puts the ribs back, or, well, he left. I had to put the ribs back in the chest and sewed everything up. And I went up to the cafeteria. And they were serving ribs for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at it, and I thought, that looks like a body. And it smelled like a body. Uh, and I, I, I no, I, I just couldn't eat it. And I don't know what you call that. It's not exactly health. It's not exactly ethical. It's just, it, it, you know. It's just a conversion experience. <laughs> and, so, and so anyway, so as, as time went on, I started to think about things in a bigger way. Because yeah. there's a whole lot more to it than just heart disease. And there also is more to it in relation to our diet choices affecting animals, the, the planet. Because in my own life, I had driven cattle to slaughter. I had hunted. Yeah, um, that's kind of North Dakota sure. <laughs> stuff. I hunted from Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, okay, same story. Same story for sure. Yeah. Although I didn't grow up in a hunting family, but I mean, it's it's just what most people do. Yeah. In the so South. anyway, I started to rethink all of these things, and and I realized that some of the things that my own family was part of, like raising cattle, um, have created some of the health. Well, many of the health problems that we're struggling with. And so. I'm guessing at that point, as you started to think differently, I mean, you sort of had this, I guess, revulsion right. to, to eating. That was sort of the first step, right? But then you started looking at literature and started kind of reading and researching and, and thinking, like, is there a health benefit to not eating meat? Or how, how did that happen? Yes, and I, I, know, I know this sounds, I mean, to you, th this sounds very s simple, um, but back in the 80s, it was not clear that food had much to do with cancer. And I remember learning that breast cancer w rates were different in different countries. Right. And that it seemed to depend on, on, on diet. And I remember talking to one of my colleagues, and I said, it looks to me like some cases of cancer, maybe many of them, are theoretically preventable. And he said, what? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and of course, now, the amount of scientific literature on that is huge. Yeah. Um, and although it's still there's still room for debate and discussion, and we do need more research, the patterns have come abundantly clear. 
that you want to follow a plant-based diet um, and you want to eat the healthiest foods. And th there's much more to it, but anyway, back, what, 30, 40 years ago, this was a complete revelation mm -hmm. because we thought cancer was bad luck. Yeah. Um, or genetics. Right. And nothing that you could perhaps control. And that's still a prevalent uh, belief today. There's still a lot of doctors yeah. that are telling their patients and every day when cancer patients come in, because I, I hear this, they, s you know, they say, well, why did I get cancer? And the doctor says, well, you know, we don't know, but it, it, might, it might be genetic or it may just be yeah. bad luck. Well, and, and it, it, that, can, that can be true. Um, there, there are some cases that are genetic and there are some cases where, I mean, you can follow a perfect diet and things still happen. Mm -hmm. um, life is not perfect and the body is, vulnerable. body is vulnerable and frankly, it's easy to get cancer. But sometimes doctors say that to make the patient feel good. To say, you had no, this wasn't anything you did. This, and sometimes it's a lie. Yeah. Um, uh, an understandable one. Yeah. I, I have a problem with it because I feel like it really disempowers the patient. You know, to, to if they sort of were patted on the head and said, there's nothing you did. Because the, the underlying message is there's nothing you can do. Right. right. I, exactly. Well, it keeps the patient passive. And it says, yeah. you got chemotherapy, you got radiation, whatever. Eat any old darn thing you want, despite the fact that that might be the most potent aspect of recovery and the one thing that the patient is totally in charge of, or patient, the person yeah. who's dealing with this. And maybe even more importantly than that, if we discount all this, we write the whole family off. Um, they, have, they, have, they can't help um, with it, and if they're at risk, we're going to ignore it. But when you talk to the patient about, well, here's what we know about diet and cancer, uh, here's what we know about diet and recovery, and staying disease-free, then the whole family can engage and you can help perhaps break a cycle where bad diet habits go from grandpa to parent to mm -hmm. grandchildren and so forth. So, yes. That's, um, that's what I'm trying to do too. Yeah, <laughs> don't I know it. <laughs> Empower people and, and help them understand that their choices matter, mm -hmm. that their choice to eat fruits and vegetables can be a game changer, that their choice to uh, exercise, and that, you know, for me, what I, what I had to do is I, kind of took a step back and, and evaluated my whole life. And I thought, look, okay, what in my life is contributing to disease or maybe contributing to disease? What can I change? And I just realized like, I can change almost everything, mm -hmm. right? I can't cure myself overnight, but I can eat a radically different, super healthy diet. I can exercise. I can remove stress producers from my life. I can forgive people who've hurt me. And so, you know, that's what we're encouraging um, people to do in our community every day, just, you know, to take control of your health and, hey, work with your doctor, great. You know, you want to do what they say, that's wonderful, but there's so much more. And the neat thing about that is, um, although people think, uh-oh, e eat a radically healthy diet, that sounds like something I'm, I'm giving up all the pleasures of life and, and that it's going to be too awkward and I won't want to do it. But as you dis what you discover is that a new diet is kind of like a new pair of shoes where it might feel awkward for the first time you try them on, but as time goes on, they feel really good, <laughs> you know, and, and you're glad with what you're eating. And if somebody said, no, Chris, don't eat any of this stuff anymore, what, whatever your favorite meals are, don't have them now, go back to what you ate when you were 15, you'd think, no way, <laughs> you know, you, you, you're just way beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's true and it does get easier. That's a great mm -hmm. analogy, I love it. I'm gonna steal that if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, it does get easier. And you start, your, your tastes change. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big thing. Like yeah. food starts to really, unhealthy food starts to taste really different. Yes. You know, it, it, you realize how greasy it is, how salty it is. Uh, like I lost a taste for animal protein at, and like I don't crave it. And so what I do crave are fruits and vegetables. I love starches, mm -hmm. I love rice and beans and legumes and yeah. like pretty much any plant. I, I enjoy eating, <laughs> which I could not say before cancer. It's funny how that happens, but it yeah. is true. Those those become foods that you crave, which, yeah. which is surprising. I think, um, yeah, I mean, my body likes it, and so my brain likes it, right. and it just, it all works together. Yeah, yeah. It's, cool, it's a cool thing. <laughs> so for, for someone watching that, um, th we're, we are bombarded with so much information now, right? And it, when I had cancer, it was in some ways easier for me because I had a handful of books, which sounds hard, but, but I only had a little bit of information and mm -hmm. that's what I focused on. But now there's 
a million websites yeah. and articles and blogs and books. And so I know there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of vigorous debate about nutritional science. Right. And you're in the you're on the forefront of this. So for someone watching that doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't understand why eating animal foods can be harmful to health, would you explain the science behind that? I mean, I know you wrote a whole book just on cheese. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the yes. cheese trap. Right. Yeah. That that's it. Um, and well, actually, I wrote that for a reason. Um, <coughs> that when we were helping people to adopt healthier diets, the one food that they were stuck on was cheese. They would say, <laughs> "Doctor Brown, I can be vegan." Except for cheese, and I think, what is it about cheese? It's this, you know, yellow asphalt. You know that if it was, if it was any more unhealthy, it would be Vaseline. But why do people get hooked on that? So, uh, we figured out why. So that's why I wrote that book. And so why? Um, why the reason? Yeah. The <laughs> reason why? Uh, the, the reason why people get hooked on it? Um, it's partly because it's salty and fatty. Uh, there's more salt in cheese than there is in potato chips. People are not aware of that. And we just like salty, greasy stuff like onion rings and french fries and stuff. So that's the minor reason. The major reason is that there are narcotics in cheese. And um, when I say narcotics, I mean opiate chemicals that are coded into the casein protein. Uh, milk's main protein is casein, mm -hmm. C-A-S-E-I-N. And it breaks apart in your digestive tract to release what are called casomorphins. They are morphine-like compounds derive from casein and they go in the blood to the brain and they attach to the very same receptors that heroin would attach to and they're, they're nowhere near as strong the strongest one is called morphoceptin and it has about one-tenth uh, the receptor binding power compared to pharmacy grade morphine wow um, so, so one-tenth still sounds like a lot well it's not enough to get you arrested <laughs> um, but, but it is just enough to make you think you know I could be vegan except for cheese it rewards yeah. the pleasure center in your brain right yeah it does. It does. And, um, and oh, and the, the reason cheese more than say milk is that there's casein in all of these products, but it's concentrated in the in the cheese making process. Okay. Um, so people just they get hooked on this stuff. Yeah. Despite the fact that it's seventy percent fat, despite the fact it has estrogens in it, um, it's goofing up health in lots of ways. I'd love to talk about hormones because you have a new book. Yeah. I'll, in fact, I'll hold it up. Your body in balance, which is all about. I'll just read the title, The New Science of Food, Hormones, and Health. Um, but before we get to that, because um, that's a huge that was a huge driver for me to stop eating animal protein yes. was the hormones, which can fuel cancer growth. Oh, yes. Um, so would you mind talking about, uh, before we get into the hormone-specific conversation, the other factors at play w when you're eating uh, animal protein and fat that are, w what's happening in your body? Yeah. In fact, we could kind of link all these together because yeah. I, I didn't mean to neglect your earlier question about what the heck is causing cancer. Um, let's say a uh, young woman. Um, she's told, drink your milk, um, dairy products are good, they're a good healthy source of calcium, and she thinks what she is missing, of course, is the fact that cows don't make calcium. Calcium is in green leafy vegetables, so cows eat grass. The calcium goes into their body. You Hopefully you're not eating grass, but you would eat broccoli or kale. Or Wheat grass. <laughs> there you go. Um, so anyway, she, she doesn't. She never needed milk for calcium as long as she's getting the, the natural sources. But she compliantly eats this stuff. What she doesn't realize is that the milk that she's consuming came out of, out of a cow. The cow makes estrogen every minute of every day that gets into, into the, the milk. And, and because dairy cows are impregnated annually, they're, they're kept pregnant, uh, pregnant cows make extra estrogen. And it gets into the, their milk and it gets into cheese. And so she's eating this, and the average American eats about 35 pounds of cheese every year, plus milk, plus yogurt, plus ice cream, plus the butter and stuff that's cooked into cookies and so forth. And she's dosing herself with estrogen. Um, estrogen is a, a hormone. It's made in the ovaries, and so it, its job is to go to her uterus and get it ready for pregnancy, and it goes throughout the body. Um, but estrogen, if it's a little too high in quantity, the estrogen molecules can pass through in, inside the breast cells. They can attach to the cellular DNA and damage them and create cancer cells. And it's been clear for a long, long time that the more estrogen is in a woman bo woman's body, the higher her risk of developing breast cancer. Um, she's not aware of any of this. She just knows that it's maybe been in her family tree or whatever. Everyone was eating the same way. Um, so dairy products contribute this 
substance that is harmful and increases cancer risk. Now that's just one facet of it. There's yeah. an, let me interject something too because the, there's sort of like a secondary effect is when you're overweight. Yes. Excess body fat is producing more estrogen, right? In women and in men. Yeah. Um, if you go to the beach and it's August and there's a guy there who stripped his shirt off and he's got kind of breast enhancement, breast development, what they call man boobs. Yep. Um, and, and a speedo. He's de definitely got to have got to have that mental image. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, but um, you'll 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 see on the internet sometimes they say well, uh, that is caused by soy because soy has phytoestrogens. Well, go right up to him and ask him how much yeah. tofu how much tofu <laughs> have you been eating the past week? You know, or the past me, year? Yeah, like edamame. Yeah. And going, what are you talking about? Um, the, Soy does not cause man boobs. <laughs> it does not. It does not feminize men or anything like that. What happened to him is that as he's been eating pizza and burgers and whatnot, he's gained weight. And his a fat cell is not just a little bag of calories. It's um, a fat cell is a hormone factory. It takes his testosterone, converts it into estradiol, uh, which is an estrogen, and that goes to his breast area and causes breast enhancement. Um, so the his body fat is, is what has done that. But it does the same in women. Uh, Postmenopausal women, the heavier they are, the higher their risk of breast cancer because the estrogen is just feeding it. Um, but there's, there's, I mean, there's a lot more to it. And you're, we first discovered this because we found that women with really bad cramps, just menstrual cramps, yeah. um, in which maybe one in 10 women, it's like, I cannot go to school today yes. type cramps. Right. Um, and they're told, welcome to adulthood. You know, this is what it is. You know, it, wait a minute. This may be what Velveeta wants you to have. Um, this is not normal for the human body to be in that kind of pain. Um, what has happened is she's got too much estrogen in her blood. It's, it's, it's every month thickening the lining of the uterus in anticipation of pregnancy. If you have too much estrogen on board, that lining thickens up too much. And as it breaks up in, with menstrual flow, it releases chemicals called prostaglandins that cause pain. So I discovered this completely <laughs> by accident with a young woman, a patient who just had terrible pain. And I, I was guessing in my mind that if we could lower her estrogen level, that she wouldn't have this anymore in the future. And to do that, we've learned, we learned a long time ago that if you have a high fiber foods, beans and vegetables and fruits, they have a way of extracting excess estrogen from the body. They help it to be removed. And so I, I suggest- and can, I, can I interject of here? Course. Is, isn't that because your liver is excreting estrogen? Yeah, it, that's exactly estrogen. right. Yeah, you, you know, the liver is, is uh, we don't appreciate it quite, in, quite enough. It, it, it's really looking out for you, and it finds things that are in your bloodstream that shouldn't be there, and it says there's too darn much estrogen in, in here. Let's get rid of it. It sends the estrogens down the bile duct into the intestine, and then as long as there's a lot of fiber there, that estrogen then will go out with the waste. If there's not fiber, then it's reabsorbed back into the blood. So you had salmon. This is important, people. Well, very much so. You yeah. Had, you had a salmon fillet for lunch. How much fiber is in there? None, because it's not a plant. You had chicken breast. You had an omelet. Animal products do not have fiber, and so women who avoid high fiber foods, um, they're recycling their estrogen all the time. And so, in a young woman, that can aggravate menstrual cramps. In uh, as she gets older, she, it'll increase her risk of breast cancer. If she's had breast cancer already, it increases her risk of dying of it. There was a. a, a Imp critically important study in California, women consuming the most high-fat dairy, cheese, butter, uh, whole milk, had a 49% higher likelihood of dying of their breast cancer compared to breast cancer patients who did not eat that stuff. Um, so the, the differences are not small. Right. They're really big. So anyway, so what are we talking about? Avoiding dairy products, um, eating lots of high-fiber foods, get the animal products out of your diet completely. Um, that brings our hormones not to zero, but to the balancing point where they should be. And by the way, not just for women, but for men too. Um, and so it allows you to... Um, because you're eating hormones. When you eat animals, you're eating hormones. You're, you're, yeah, you, well, in the dairy, you're eating hormones, and then the, the fat that you eat really from any source um, causes your body to make excess estrogens, um, and fiber is helps you eliminate them, and if you're not eating fiber, then that's part of the problem too. So anyway, the reason I wrote this book is I thought, how yes, thank you. Um, how many women are, are dealing with, have, have cramps, they're at high risk for cancer, they've got endometriosis. Um, I described the ca case of a, an Air Force aerospace engineer. She was in Iraq. Uh, she was there in 2003 and
spent a long time there uh, in a battle zone. I mean, you, you don't gain weight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't eat much. Yes. You're working hard. As soon as she got yes. home to Louisiana, her family said, Catherine, you're welcome home. You know, what did you miss while you were gone? So, you know, th th she, so she started tucking into mac and cheese. Fried and chicken. Cheese, <laughs> all, all that stuff. And she started to gain weight, but she also developed uh, pain that turned out to be endometriosis. This mm. is a condition where cells that line the uterus have escaped and they're now implanting all around the abdomen and they can cause terrible pain, they cause infertility because they can strangle the fallopian tubes. So um, as time went on, medical treatments were not helping. Uh, they, they tried hormonal treatments and painkillers and nothing worked. So the doctor finally suggested a hysterectomy. You know, just take everything out and you'll be all right. And she thought, well, you know, she's 27. It's a big deal. Well, she and her husband were kind of newlyweds and mm -hmm. they, they, she hadn't raised a family, you know, whatever. But she wasn't getting better, so she said, okay. Uh, and th the reason she said okay is her doctor told her that she was infertile anyway, as a result of the disease. Okay. Um, so she, they scheduled the procedure for six weeks from that point. During that interval, a friend dragged her to a nutritionist and said, Catherine, you eat just junk. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's clean this up. And so the nutritionist said, all right, vegan diet, no animal products at all, out with your mac and cheese and whatever and keep oils really low. And she just really cleaned up her diet. And she started to feel better. Um, and she improved and improved and improved. But she's very dutiful. Six weeks came, she showed up at the operating room. And the doctor started the hysterectomy. See, you, 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 what you do is you insert a laparoscope yep. under the belly button. And you're looking around because you're going to take it out through that tube. And an hour later, she woke up in the recovery room. And the doctor's shaking her shoulder saying, Catherine, i got to tell you something. Your endometriosis is gone. I didn't. I did not do the hysterectomy. You still got your uterus. I. I didn't feel good about it. You had some scarring. She had some some scarring from where the disease had been, mm -hmm. and some adhesions that still hurt a little bit. Um, and so he he freed up the adhesions. That's all he did. He said, "I don't know what happened. Your endometriosis is, is gone away." Anyway, um, and this was about six weeks. You said right? this was in six weeks' time. Yeah, um, and. Her mother was in the, in the recovery room and said, she went vegan, that's the answer. And the doctor, the doctor was totally annoyed. said, no, <laughs> stop it. You know, foods don't cause this. Um, and foods can't cure it. It's, it's just, uh, it's some women just have it. Um, well, what the doctor wasn't thinking is all that cheese has estrogens in it. Estrogens are the prime driver of endometriosis. And she wasn't eating high fiber foods to help her eliminate it. It was a classic case of hormones out of balance. And yet doctors don't teach this. So she still got a uterus. She was not infertile. She was out of balance. She has three children now. Um, and Isn't that great? Well, and endometriosis is not going to kill you. Menstrual cramps are not going to kill you. These are signs that you're not in balance. And that same out of balance condition is what's going to lead to breast cancer. So they're the early warning signs. Or uterine right? cancer. Well, they're signs of being out of balance. Um, or ovarian cancer. Now, we can't stop all of these things. You can't control it all. But if there's something you can control, let's use that. Yeah. And and for doctors, we need to understand. We, we need to be a little more humble. And the risk um, reduction is significant, though. Even though you can't ever yes. say you're cancer proof, we can say... The risk reduction is huge. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, the, the body... The body's healing power is not perfect, but it's darn good, and we should use it. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so um, what about chicken? What about beef? What about pork? Like, aside from, right. so we've kind of covered dairy and estrogens, but are there other compounds or properties in animal food that, you know, are harmful to the body over time? Um, in some cases, hormones are used when they're raising uh, the animals. They'll put you know, a little pellet behind the ear of a, of a, uh, you know, t when you're trying to produce beef. Um, and the idea is to get the maximum growth per unit feed. Um, however, I honestly don't think that that's the big issue. Um, that's not helpful and we don't need it. But the big issue is that when you eat that animal fat, by a mechanism that we do not understand, it increases the amount of estrogen in a woman's body. Um, and the, the reason we know this is that Tufts University researchers locked women up into a research ward. These are volunteers. And they fed them a variety of diets. And by increasing the fat, fat content, you can cause the estrogens to just increase. And then you can increase fiber, and it goes back down. Or, and you can do these things at the same time. And it's, it's abundantly clear. So I think the big problem with beef is it's not necessarily the, the the chemicals that they use, 
it's the product itself. This could be an or organically grown cow mm -hmm. um, who got a massage every day <laughs> and was loved <laughs> by the by the butcher and all. acupuncture. I mean, all, all this, yeah, yeah. Listen to NPR. You know, very happy. But the, but but nonetheless, if you when you eat that food, it is it is nutritionally so different from the foods that get you into balance. You are mm -hmm. not a cat. You whether we like it or not, we are in the great ape family, and those animals are largely or completely herbivores. So what about TMAO and uh, heme iron and some of those things, IGF-1? All these, all these are part of it. You know, with, with heme iron, um, back in the 1950s, this was you know, beef's bragging point. We've got a highly absorbable form of iron. Um, mm -hmm. And then we learned, wait a minute, iron is linked to heart disease. Iron is linked to Alzheimer's disease. So y you need some iron, but you want just the right amount, not the overdose. And in green vegetables, also in beans, there is what is called non-heme iron that your body can absorb more of if it needs it and absorb less of it if you already have plenty al already. So non -heme, anyway, so non-heme iron, or non-heme iron is healthy for the body. The heme iron that's in, in meat in particular um, is a contributor to cancer risk, particularly color, you know, color colorectal. colorectal cancer, yeah. Something I learned in researching my book was that um, the body doesn't have a great way to get rid of iron. And so it's it it just builds up. Yeah, it, you get you get iron toxicity. Unless you're a woman menstruating, then you're you're releasing iron every month. And after age fifty, you've lost that. Right. You know, and and so it builds up. That's the reason why if you look at uh, vitamin pills for older folks, they don't have iron in them because they know you've got so much on board. Oh. They they yeah they take it out. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a it's a serious issue. And can you talk about uh, IGF one? Yes, um, IGF one is insulin like growth factor number one. And IGF-1, if, if you mix prostate cancer cells in a test tube with IGF-1, they grow like crazy. It, it's a growth factor. Mm -hmm. uh, if you mix breast cancer cells in a test tube with IGF-1, they grow. Um, if you do a blood test, and I, and I stick a needle in your arm and I measure your IGF-1 level, it's correlated with your risk of prostate cancer, or for a woman, breast cancer, down the road. Well, what increases IGF-1? Um, if you feed uh, an adult volunteer three glasses of milk every day, their IGF-1 blood, blood level will, will rise. Why? Because milk came out of a cow for the purpose, if I can put it this way, of growing that calf, of making the calf, of facilitating that very rapid growth in that calf. And then weaning says, stop. It's, it's dangerous to have continued growth when you're already fully grown. That can mean the growth of cancer cells. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I don't believe it's only prostate cancer, only breast cancer. It, IGF-1 probably uh, encourages the growth of many forms of cancer. Uh, you have a little bit in your blood, um, less the older you get, but it's artificially elevated when people drink milk. I, there, I saw a supplement company recently cl um, claiming that their supplement raised IGF-1 and they were targeting older folks, yes, saying you yes. need more IGF-1 and you need to take our supplement. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Complete mistake. Um, I, I've seen the same. It's, it's this marketing thing that's, uh, as you're older, you know, you don't have as much IGF-1 and you need this to feel good and whatever. Uh, nature isn't always wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, IGF-1 levels are high during your growth years and they come down, um, not just when you're 70, but when you're 20. I mean, they're, they're, they're diminishing. And leave it alone. <laughs> you know, it's a powder keg. When I was in my early 20s, I got into weightlifting and bodybuilding and I was trying to really trying to bulk uh, up yeah. I'm a naturally thin guy and I was drinking you know half a gallon of milk a day I was taking these you know tons of whey eggs, protein yeah. eggs I was eating tons of tuna uh, and yeah just tons of tons of animal protein and uh, very little fiber and very little vegetables it was just protein 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 and um, you know that was just a few years before I got cancer right so I don't, I don't claim that caused my cancer, but I feel like it probably didn't help the process, right? All of those, I mean, my, my IGF-1, I'm sure, was through the roof. It will change very rapidly. Um, you, you, can, you can, yes, uh, exactly the diet that you're describing is the perfect way to, to increase that, and it's an unfortunate mistake. There's, and there's a common, uh, sort of commonly known strategy among bodybuilders that, you know, if you really want to get big, you drink a gallon of milk a day. Milk will make you big. You know, just like growing a cow, a baby well, cow. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but you know, it's it's funny all the things that are coming out against that. Um, the the issues even with men's men's uh, fertility. 
Uh, there was a, just the other day, the Journal of the, New, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association looked at different dietary patterns and men's fertility. And the, the introduction to this article said, why is it that men's sperm counts are dropping so rapidly? They dropped about 50% really? in the last oh, 60 or 70 years. They said, could the reason be that people are eating more meat, more cheese, and so forth? Um, the, the very same questions we're asking. And so they looked at dietary patterns. And the people who had the lowest sperm counts were the men eating lots of meat or, or even lacto-vegetarian type of diets where it's, I'm not eating meat, but I'm going to make up for it with cheese, cheese and so forth. Yeah. And um, there was uh, similarly a study in uh, Rochester, New York, where they looked at men in a fertility clinic. And the same story, the men who ate the most cheese had the lowest sperm counts. Erectile dysfunction is an issue for many men, and it's linked to diet as well. And the same scenario happens in every clinic, including ours, where the guy walks into the clinic and he says, doctor, you know, there's something wrong with my nature, you know, it's not really working. Um, and you can write a prescription for Viagra, mm -hmm. um, but the doctor must give the patient the following speech, which is, the reason that you have erectile dysfunction, it's not performance anxiety. You have narrowed arteries, and your arteries are narrowed by atherosclerosis. What that means is that cholesterol particles have irritated the artery walls, causing little bumps that look like blisters to form, and that slows down the blood flow. And if you don't have blood flow to your private parts, like they don't work, nothing happens. You know, the male sexual anatomy is a hydraulic system. <laughs> it needs good blood flow to work, and it was designed on a Monday. Things are going wrong with that all the time. <laughs> but any, anyway, if you don't get blood flow, you don't. Nothing happens. So, uh, and the patient can take Viagra, and that will open up those arteries for a couple hours. Um, but what the patient has to tell the patient is that this atherosclerosis is also present in your heart and in your, the arteries to your brain, meaning that if you have erectile dysfunction, you are at much higher risk than other men for a heart attack or stroke within the next three to five years. So take Viagra if you want to, but we need to open up those arteries to save your life. And if we do that with a healthy vegan diet, I mean, no animal products, keep the oils really low, the arteries then gradually open up in the heart, in the brain, um, and also in the man's private parts, meaning he doesn't need that Viagra anymore because his arteries have opened up again. That's another one of those early warning signs yeah, of you know, cardiovascular disease, right? So Canary in the coal mine. It's the cana you know, canary in the coal That's mine. It. So um, you mentioned cholesterol, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a big debate about cholesterol and some people are saying it's great cholesterol is not a problem doesn't matter what your cholesterol level is and then there are other professionals such as yourself who are saying no too much cholesterol is problematic can you can you touch on that and yes it's it's a discussion frankly that shouldn't be happening because the people who say cholesterol doesn't matter are the same people who believe the world is flat I, I, I have to say that the, the science is so far beyond this that it just it's a tribute to the internet that these people even have a forum. Cholesterol without question matters. Um, and specifically, um, you do a blood test, if your low density lipoprotein cholesterol, LDLC, is higher, you're at higher risk for a heart attack. You're probably also at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there are all kinds of people who are trying to make this go away. Um, particularly the meat industry yeah. and the egg industry. <coughs> they are and the meat lovers. Yeah. Right? Just the influencers right. who just love to promote paleo and keto and in meat eating because they love it. They do. Um, however, the evidence is extremely strong. Um, so anyway, yes. Uh, and, and what drives LDL um, is uh, number one, eating cholesterol, which is especially in eggs, but more mm -hmm. importantly, eating uh, saturated fat. That's the bad fat. In there's a fair amount of it in beef. There's also quite a lot in chicken, and surprisingly, in fish. People think fish, that's all omega-3. It's not. Omega-3 is a minority uh, of the fat in fish. Hmm. Chinook salmon has about the same amount of bad fat as, as steak does. And so eating saturated fat is can driving up cholesterol and yes. estrogen. Yes. Which most people have never heard. Uh, either of those things, right? They are, you um, yes, but it's very repeatable in, in research studies, and, and it, unfortunately it's gotten kind of crowded out of what, from what people know. Yeah. Okay, uh, one fun question and then one kind of serious question uh, okay. to wrap it up. So the fun question is, if you had to eat the same three meals every day, what would it look like? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. 
Well, this is where I should tell you a lie because if, <laughs> if I told you what I really eat, it's not going to sound so appetizing. Because no, I want to know. No, I'm, I'm supposed to make this up. I'm supposed to say I would just have pancakes with butter and syrup every day because then other people could relate to that. Um, <laughs> and I'd say, and, and as a vegan, I just leave off the butter, and isn't that wonderful? But, but, <laughs> I, but the truth is, my tastes have drifted so much mm -hmm. um, in my own transition. You know, I, I love my tr transition to plant-based diet. I love Mexican food, so I would like have a bean burrito loaded with jalapeno peppers, um, and I love Chinese food, so I would have uh, tofu with broccoli and things like that, and I'd love to spice it up. And there's an Italian place near my house where I'll have angel hair pasta with this spicy um, tomato sauce with, with a little bit of garlic, and they sometimes will grill some mushrooms and throw them in there, and or sushi, which it's not fish sushi, it's going to be... Cucumber rolls. Veggie rolls. Yes, yeah. asparagus rolls, sweet potato rolls. You shouldn't have fish sushi unless you're extremely well insured. Um, <laughs> so, so all those things are, are cool. But to tell you the truth, I'm like what you were saying. I've gotten hooked on green vegetables. And when I was a kid, I was phobic of it. I didn't want, mm -hmm. oh, broccoli, ugh. You know, but now I have broccoli for breakfast. So for me, I, I know this sounds like terrible, and I shouldn't tell you this, but it's true. I love broccoli. I'll have often tofu, which I have a nonstick pan. I take the tofu and I marinate it in... Um, little soy sauce for like 15 seconds. It's just real quick. Throw it in a nonstick pan. It comes out just really good. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I always want to have something like either something starchy with it, either like rice or oatmeal or, um, or, or maybe a papaya or something like that. And that's what I'm eating. But that's, if your friends, your if your friends ask, us pancakes with syrup. <laughs> so. so that's your, that's your typical breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I love it. I, mine is oatmeal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every morning oatmeal, hemp seed, flaxseed, chia seed, some some fresh fruit. You can't do better. Yeah, I, it it fills me up. It gives me like sustained energy all day. I feel good. Not all day, but you know, till lunchtime. Yeah, sure. So, what about lunch and dinner? What do those look like for yeah, you? Yeah, that's where f for lunch it's usually a little heavier for me. So that's where my bean burrito might, might yeah c might come in. Or sometimes I'll make a rice bowl where I'll put um, some brown rice. I have a special way of cooking it, but I put brown rice on the bottom of a Pyrex bowl. And then I'll put a lot of green vegetables on top, and sometimes I'll douse them with soy sauce or brags. You know the brags. Oh, for spray. sure. Yeah. Um, and then maybe a little bit of tofu on top, and a little sprinkle of ginger. And I bring it to work. I just zap it. And there's a little dog in the next office who shares my broccoli because he, <laughs> he, he, he loves it. <laughs> and that's my routine every day for lunch, and for dinner, um, a little lighter. Um, and that's where something like miso soup and veggie sushi or something would come in. Yeah, that's great. I love it. All that sounds delish. And you have a lot of recipes in a lot of your books. Yeah. And most of your books have, have recipes in them, don't they? Yes, they do. In fact, let me brag about this new one, um, Your Body in Balance. Because there it is one more time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when, when I did this book, I am an idiot in the kitchen. You know, I just make the world's simplest things. Um, so Lindsay Nixon did the recipes for this, and she is fabulous. Um, she's just the greatest recipe developer. So she sent me 65 recipes, but she sent me a note. She said, Neil, I didn't tell you this, um, and I hope you like the recipes, but your way of eating cured my menstrual cramps. So I thought, okay, there we go. It's really, it really is true you can get in balance. That's perfect. Okay, so um, the serious question that I'd like to end with is, somebody comes to your office and they have cancer, and they just, and they wanna know, it, 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 and, and they really are wanting help. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that person? You know, just in terms of the mindset, attitude, like how, how do you encourage them? I don't know if my attitude is right or wrong. I, I never feel that it's up to me to decide what their values should be. Um, I don't cheer people up particularly. Um, I don't, it, it's basically, I want to be there with you, but you're the one who's in charge of where this is all going. And I want to provide information that you can help uh, th that you can use to, to th that can help you, and that will help your family. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to talk about where we are now, what foods can can help, what evidence we have that this will work. Um, people are always naturally skeptical. Their family members are a little reluctant, and they have caregivers who tell them stupid stuff like just eat anything you can eat. You know, as long as you can eat, let's put it ice cream and all this. You hey, know what I'm talking. Some of their doctors are telling them that too. Yeah, you just got to counter counteract all that stuff. But anyway, if if the person it, it wants to do this, and frankly, 
everybody does. This is another thing. Is doctors think you don't want to change your diet? You know, you're too lazy. They 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 tell the patient what their value should be. Yeah. Wait a minute. You got a cancer diagnosis? Are you kidding? I will change things. Yeah. You know, I can do this. So so don't. Anyway, um, for, for yeah. my for colleagues, don't make up values for your patients. Let them have their values, and if their value is I want to live, you know, I'm there with you. Then there's bumps in the road. And there's times where people goof up. And that's when sometimes doctors treat the patient like an employee. You didn't do what I told you. Wait, 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 wait. This is their life. Let the patient do what they wish to do. Always be a good coach. You know, you, you've got to believe in that patient. I, I don't care what their struggles are. You can see the success that they're going to have. Mm. And if a person goofs up, don't we all? Dust yourself off. Get back in the game. Um, and people want to change. And the good thing is, at least at our <coughs> clinic, the doctors don't have to take hours to do the nutrition teaching. They've got to validate it. And our nutritionists, our dietitians, they take hours. And they can do menu planning and so forth. And they know more about different things, uh, different good substitutes and what to do at restaurants than our doctors do anyway. And we work together as, as a, a team. And then you don't want people to be alone. You, you know, if you're doing this alone, you're not taking advantage of what other people. You know, lots of other people are in this too. You know, so, so we want to we want to share information back and forth. So we have classes that we offer every every week for free for people who come, and people share information and they problem solve with each other, and it's just life changing and really cool. So that's why what I like about what you what you're doing is that you're reaching zillions of people. And they're thinking, oh wow, I didn't know about that. And then they're sharing what you found and they're learning from your experience, but they're learning from each other too. And you've, you've created this really cool community. So, you know, forgive me for Thank being you. so long-winded about yeah. this. Oh, yeah, I, I feel like we, we let people heal if that's what they want to do. Provide the resources for it. Provide some encouragement. People will be discouraged. They'll hear contrary voices. Let's just work through that. Let the body heal. Well, folks, now you know why I'm such a big fan of Dr. Neil Barnard. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. It's you, been Chris. a pleasure. Sure, likewise. Please share this video. I mean, what an amazing, brilliant uh, physician uh, Dr. Barnard is. Um, again, I'll promote his, his new latest book one more time, Your Body in Balance. But, you know, if you go to Am Amazon and type in Neil Barnard, you're going to see a whole bunch of books, and any of them you want to read are going to be fantastic. Uh, and you may find one that's specific to your situation, if it's diabetes, if it's weight loss, you know, heart disease. You have a heart well, disease book? Each one, each one is a tool. Where there's, yeah. If there's something that I get all excited about and I think, how do I package this? Yeah. That's what they're really for. Yeah, so he's created an, an amazing library of resources for you and um, for all of us. So I, I just love that. And you mentioned community. I mean, you know, we're on a vegan cruise mm -hmm. together and this is just, it's been really fun. We're on day two and like, you want to get yourself around other people that are on a, a healthier healing journey. I think that's really important because that encouragement and ideas and resources mm -hmm. and information, inspiration, all of that stuff happens when you get out of your house, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, you insert yourself into a, a new environment with people that are like you and understand you and maybe are a little farther along on their health healing journey than you are. So I just thank you so much for the work you do. Um, it's uh, just remarkable and inspiring and it makes me want to do more and uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. Well, thanks for including me and thanks for all the great work that you're doing. Awesome. Okay, everybody, please share this video with people you care about. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.